Welcome. Everything is great. You are listening to Forking Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. And I'm Jason. We'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. Today we're talking about Season 2, Episode 3, Dance, Dance, Resolution. It was written by Megan Amram, who last wrote Season 1, Episode 7, The Eternal Shriek, and co-wrote Season 1, Episode 11, Mindy St. Clair. This episode was directed by Drew Goddard, who last directed the series premiere. This episode aired September 28th, 2017. So diving right into some responses from our last episode, Ruji Q said, How do you feel about the theory that the good place is also the bad place for Michael? He seems pretty tortured. We actually have that acknowledged in this episode. Mm-hmm. It's one of the solutions, quote unquote, that the gang comes up with. Yes. And personally, I actually think that that's the writers calling out a theory that a lot of fans have. Oh, absolutely. That Michael is in the bad place himself. Mm-hmm. That it's sort of a bad place within a bad place. At least that's what I'm hoping. Probably just because there's been that theory going around for such a long time. Exactly. That I hope it doesn't come true. Yeah, I think them bringing it up kind of squashes it. Yeah. I believe the same thing happened in season two of Lost. There were a lot of fan theories about what was going on on the island. And one of the popular ones was that they were all in purgatory. And it was actually acknowledged by one of the characters. Hurley actually just says... I think we're in purgatory, and they're like, nope. That's not it. That's not it. All right, thank you for your your question. Moving on to the next comment, Alan Alstrom at Chipper Allen. I think Jason's arc was towards self-expression in season one. He went from being anonymous to being himself, doing what he wants, without shame. I, I like that. I didn't really think too much about what Jason's arc was during season one, because we don't see him change as much as the other characters. But it's true. He went from pretending to act like Acid Cat in his life on Earth to pretending to be Jianyu and then to finally just accepting himself for who he is. Which isn't a great person, but it's at least authentic. Right. It is who he is. He's not trying to be anybody else. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Alan. Our next message comes from Kate. I do human things on Twitter. She said, I wonder if the soulmates will have to remain the same to keep up the ruse for Sean. Unclear on how attentive he is. And Green Janet, we hardly knew ye. Mm -hmm. Sean doesn't seem very attentive at all if they've gone through 800 attempts and he still thinks they're on attempt number two. I I wonder how Michael is keeping that information from him, though. Yeah. Sean's just not checking in or he's trusting Michael. Which he shouldn't. He should not. There's no way he should be doing this because... The only thing between Michael and retirement is this attempt number two working. So, of course, he's going to lie and Mm -hmm. say that it's going just fine or marvelously when it's not. Right. Sean, you should pay more attention. Bad bossing. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for your thoughts, Kate. Our next message comes from Max Veiling at Dreadful Gate on Twitter. Thanks for calling out how inefficient Michael's plan is. Also, keeping them apart when the point is for them to torture each other? Hmm. Yeah. Keeping them apart for too long doesn't really make a lot of sense if they're the ones that are actually supposed to torture each other. Exactly. Michael is kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. He's got to keep them apart for long enough, but the point is to keep them together so they torture each other. But if they're together, they figure it out. So he's walking a really fine line. And it seems like Eleanor is able to figure it out regardless of whether or not she finds Chidi or Tahani or Jason. Yeah, there were several examples of her finding it out by herself. There's one moment where she's sitting in the courtyard with all the demons, and it really seems like she just figures it out during her orientation. Yeah, I wonder what the tell was for that. Hmm. Max also mentions Janet uh, taking Jason to the four of them, taking Jason to the three of them at the end of the last episode, because we were questioning that ourselves. Like, how did Janet know to bring Jason to Eleanor's house? And Max says, well, it's pretty easy because all she needs to know is everyone in the good place. And that's just the four of them. So she takes them to those four. Mm -hmm. There's nobody else for her to take him to. Yeah. (laughs) I didn't even think about that. Although we did get a few hints last season that Janet was being requested by some of the demons. Yes. So, so I'm, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I'm not too sure if Janet actually knows that there's only four people in the good place. She might. I like that theory. Mm-hmm. I think it's probably 
the theory that makes the most sense. It's like each of the demons are a blind spot for her when yeah. she looks down the street and only sees Tahani out of a crowd. Huh. Interesting. It's definitely something to think about. All right, so let's get to the episode. Jason, tell me right off the bat, did you enjoy this one? Yes. More than the last one? Yes. I like this episode for what it gives us as viewers and what we're expecting and how it subverts our expectations. Okay. I dislike it for the possibility of writers getting lazy. Okay. And what I mean by that is I don't want the writers to fall back to this plot device of we can just reset everything. We don't have to actually say or do anything of substance in the show anymore. Mm -hmm. And I know that's not going to happen, but it's definitely like a 1% worry okay. in my head. I think I get what you mean. We want our actions to have consequences, exactly. whether they are negative or positive. And being able to reboot at any time is a lot of power mm -hmm. for the writers to have. Now, don't get me wrong. I love that they're, that this episode happened. And I, it was extremely important for this episode to happen. But they need to move on from it. Mm -hmm. I feel the same as you. All right. So you want to dive in? Michael begins attempt number three on the neighborhood experiment. On the 128th day, Michael asks one of the core four to enter an obelisk headed to the bad place. And Eleanor once again discovers the truth. Michael resets. And that's our cold open. So we learn as soon as Eleanor asks Janet to find somebody to teach her ethics, Janet's got a index of all the members of The Good Place. Well, of course she does. Right. So <laughs> she knows everybody, who they are, and what they did in their past life. Right. That's probably an important thing to know hmm. in the future. Possibly. I wonder, though, does she have the correct database does she know that eleanor shellstrop is not whatever michael has chosen to pretend she is you know environmental lawyer or does she have eleanor shellstrop the kind of crappy salesperson that right. she was on on earth or that she was a good salesperson but so yeah. like beside chidi's name of like professor of ethics it doesn't say belongs in the bad place with like a big red stamp no, no, no. I don't think she has, like, a where they belong. I'm just wondering if she knows, hey, that this Eleanor mm -hmm. is a say was a salesperson. Because Janet's That's... not there to judge. Right. No, she's not. She's just an information system. That is a good thought. Does she have the correct information? Mm -hmm. I like that Chidi was a little bit more specific on what he studied and taught. He said he focused on deontology. And I just want a quick little note here. Deontology is the ethical position that judges the morality of an action based on rules. So it is sometimes described as rule or obligation or duty-based ethics because rules bind you to your duty. And this explains Chidi and Eleanor's exploration of Kant and contractarianism and natural rights theory from season one. So I thought that was perfect. It's just, oh, that's why he talked about those guys so much. So it makes a little bit more sense. Yeah. If you're paying attention along with us. <laughs> so this cold open really feels like season one all over again, because at the end of it with the obelisk, it's exactly like the train to the bad place that we got in season one. Mm -hmm. It shows that he's been backed into a corner again and that there's not really any way of getting out of this other than resetting. Right. So what's his end game? Like, does he think they're going to fight over who's going to go down there for the rest of eternity? Does he think, like, what's oh, he going to do? I wonder, and this is sadistic, I wonder if he was thinking of trapping one of them in the obelisk and just, like, putting it in his office and just saying that that person ended up having to go to the bad place. Oh, that would suck. Yeah. Like an Iron Maiden, just, like, in this device, mm -hmm. stuck. Yeah. Unable to really move or do anything. Because all the others would be tortured, and the person stuck in the obelisk is, of course, tortured, just in a more traditional bad place way. Mm-hmm. Mm. That would be awful. Yep. And then maybe in like 50 years, you could let them out and like they say they came crawling back from the bad place and like someone and could take their place. And they technically, they were in the bad place. Right. Right? That could be good. Oh man, I feel like I have dark corners of my mind now. If Michael had, <laughs> if Michael had executed that properly, I think that could have been genius. Oh, that could have been so good. Not knowing if you're alive or dead or if you're dreaming or alive, you just go insane. Yep. Okay. 
Okay, this got dark. Next. <laughs> Moving on. I just really want to point out that I love Jason's line when he says, I'm too young to die and too old to order off the kids menu. What a stupid age I am. That is a terrible age. <laughs> <laughs> I love it because, Jason, you're dead. Did you not get that memo? And also, I totally feel you on ordering off the kids menu. Sometimes it's the best option. Sometimes that grilled cheese and french fries looks delicious. Yep. And that's all you want. You want to pay four bucks for it. Yep. And that's it. (laughs) (laughs) So this is our second time seeing Eleanor reveal that this is the bad place. Mm -hmm. She really nailed it even the second time. Oh, yeah. It was great. It was the (gasps) the gasp moment of the holy fork and shirt balls. Oh, yeah. You really believe that this is the first time that she's discovered this. Mm -hmm. And every time she does discover it, it's still great. Mm -hmm. And we still get to see some great Kristen Bell acting. And we get quite a bit of it this episode. Yeah, she must have had a fun time giving us all those reactions. Oh, yeah. It must have been fun cutting that together. Yeah. All right, moving on. In attempt number 11, the core four have started studying ethics together. Eleanor discovers the truth when her soulmate begins to sing his spoken word jazz opera. I'm sorry, it's just... Oh, that sounds terrible. Spoken word jazz opera. They picked three things that I'm certain Eleanor hates. Yeah. With a fiery passion. A montage shows us clips from hundreds of attempts, Eleanor's realizations, Janet's reboots, and new neighborhood restaurants. In attempt 649, Jason is the one who figures it out. So, we start off... And find out that the core four is studying ethics together, which I Mm -hmm. think is interesting. Yeah, so Tahani's there. I'm wondering how that happened. And I also wonder if they know if Jason is Jason or if they still think he's Jianyu. He doesn't actually talk during that scene. That's true. So I'm curious. I wish we could see a little bit more of that. But we can see that things are a bit different this time, Mm -hmm. right? Tahani is with them for some reason. I wonder if she knows who Eleanor is and knows what's going on. Maybe Tahani just decided to take these lessons with her soulmate. Right. Because she knew that he was going for whatever reason. She wanted to get closer to him and connect on a different level. Yeah. And she wanted to, I don't know, allow other people to bask in her presence, I suppose. Because this is day number, (laughs) this is day 43 on attempt number 11. Mm Mm-hmm. And I like that Chidi calls out something we talked about last season, Hume's bundle theory of the self. And he's all excited about it, too. He's like, guess what we're talking about today? Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> oh, oh, he's God. so cute. And and Eleanor's potentially sarcastic, most likely sarcastic comment that it's going to be a real banger. Mm-hmm. I like that. That's fun. Yep. Uh, Michael's line when he's in the jazz band when Eleanor figures it out, it's just so ridiculously. It's like, it's supposed to be cool jazz lingo and like, but it's just so weird and wrong and off. That was a real trip for biscuits. And now we're all wet daddy. O. <laughs> but you know, it kind of works for Michael because he tries to appear human. Yeah. Which is fantastic. Like he, he was playing with paper clips in season one mm-hmm. and just, I don't know whether he's doing it to mess with humans or whether he's just doesn't understand humans. I think, I think it's, it's that. I think it's the whole take it sleazy thing. He just wanted to say it at some point. So then he heard some fun jazz lingo and he was like, that sounds cool. Let's try it out. Yeah. Which I'm okay with. Oh, yeah. It's great. It's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. And the jazz band is also called the Jazz Splainers. Mm-hmm. Just like the Mansplainers. Oh, is that what that is? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So for attempt number 218 with Tahani as Eleanor's soulmate, how would that work? See, I don't think that Eleanor would have been like, hey, what's this? No, A of course not. A woman is no, no, my no. soulmate? That's not what I mean. Oh, okay. Jason and Tahani are supposed to be soulmates. Right. So Jason would be paired with somebody else. I'm assuming another monk like he was in attempt number two. Mm-hmm. Tahani would definitely be torturing Eleanor. Yep, and Eleanor would be torturing Tahani, I think, too. Okay. Because okay. Eleanor doesn't let her get away with anything. Right. She, she doesn't she... just stand by while Tahani goes on and on about all the famous people she knew and how great she was on Earth. Mm-hmm. Eleanor is very obvious about her distaste for it. Right. I want to hope that attempt number 218 lasted for 
hundreds and hundreds of days. Oh, yeah? And Eleanor and Tahani lived horribly ever after. <laughs> see, a lot of people were saying, oh, I really want to see that attempt. And I do, too. Yeah. I don't actually think it would work that well. Yeah, though. I don't like, think it would either. Them as a couple? I don't think it would last long. It might last the day before Eleanor's like, this is torture. Oh, wait. This is the bad place. It might last a while. I don't know. It depends. Eleanor's kind of one of those people you have to grow to love, right? So it's possible that she would feel that way about her soulmate. But I don't know if it would have lasted hundreds and hundreds of days. Yeah, not yeah. even, not a chance. I think they would have gotten on each other's nerves too quickly. And then after Tahani was... A golden retriever. Um, I'm talking before oh. the golden retriever. Oh, yeah, that guy looked Lerf? like an elf. His name was Lurf. Wait, not an elf. He looked like a, a gnome. Yeah, I, I don't even... I want to know troll. if that's... If that... One of the little troll dolls. Yeah, yeah, like that. yeah, for sure. Yeah, Whatever. not in a bad way. No. He was cute. Just... But is he from something? I don't His think His name so. is Lurf. That's got to be something from somewhere. I didn't recognize a reference in there. Yeah, me neither. But it's got to be. Okay, this guys. This is so weird. If you know where this Lurf dude is from, if he's from anything at all, please let us know. Because I looked at him and I was like, well, that's a troll doll. <laughs> But in a good way. I don't mean to say that he's unattractive. I just, the hair, it really looks like a troll doll's hair. Anyway. Mm-hmm. And then we got the golden Then retriever, we got the golden retriever. Which is such a beautiful concept. 333, I think. Uh, what a life. And in one of the cutaways of her discovering it's the bad place, uh, we have the promo shot mm-hmm. in the field of cacti holding the balloons. And yeah. I thought, how would she figure out it's the bad place in that situation? Why was she in that situation? And then I thought, maybe she was supposed to deliver balloons to somebody through a field of cacti. And then she realized this is the worst thing to do ever. Yeah, that... The balloons are going to pop. Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) Or they're just like, we should use this promo shot as one of the sequences. It it feels symbolic to me more than anything else. It doesn't feel like there's actually a story there. It just feels like... Hey, here's Eleanor holding down these balloons who are clearly trying to float up. She's being held down. There's all these cactuses down here. They're harmful things that hurt you. Especially balloons. Yeah. It just, it felt very symbolic. Right. Yeah. And then there was another one where Chidi and Eleanor, it looks like they were on a date. Yeah, I think they were on a picnic date. Yeah. Which, okay, I'm in. (laughs) I want to see that attempt. Sign me up. Yep. And then there was the... It was the four of them hiding in Eleanor's house from that clown. What the heck is going on there? That was like a Buffy episode. I'd be yeah. terrified. Yeah. Monster of the week for sure. Yeah. Okay. I, I just don't understand what that was. It was like floating around. Did Michael think, oh, I'm going to send a weird clown to Eleanor's house? Because dead giveaway, buddy. Yep. A little bit. I would like to imagine it was one of the paintings that came to life. Oh my god. Or like she woke up in the middle of the night and one of them was standing in front of her bed and she was like, <gasps> she was having a sleepover with the three of them and they all just were like, oh, I don't know. Oh, I like that. The sleepover <laughs> part. That sounds fun. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. I wonder if at certain points he knew that they were about to find out. So he was just like, all right, let's just mess stuff up. So he just decided, okay, I'm going to make this creepy clown painting come to life. Like you were saying. Because he was like, you know what? Just I need to spice fun. things up a little bit. I'm getting a little bored. At least I'm going to get to see them scare before I have to reset everything. Mm-hmm. Sounds fun. And the one that I like a lot is that Michael clearly chose to have one attempt be full of monks mm-hmm. so that no one would talk to each other. So he could just avoid them actually meeting up and realizing it. Right. I think that's so fun. That would have been great. Yeah. (laughs) I'm just a little sad that we didn't get to see the other three. That would have been fun to maybe just see them further down the line. That could Mm -hmm. have been good. And we get a lot of great fail safe moments from Janet. Yes. The Hamilton tickets one is probably my favorite. David Diggs coming back. (laughs) Man, don't kill her before she gets to see Hamilton. That's true cruelty. (laughs) I really like the new neighborhoods that we get to see as well. I'm going to point out the restaurant names because they're just so good and they go by too quickly. We have lasagna come out tomorrow. The sun will come out tomorrow. We get you do the hokey gnocchi and you get yourself some food. (laughs) That's cute. The fact that they managed to fit gnocchi into their food puns. A plus. Mm-hmm. We appreciate food we puns. We love food puns. If you guys are listeners to our other podcast, Burger of the Week, we do weekly burger puns. 
So and it's a lot of fun. Get on that if you enjoyed this. Yeah, so we appreciate these restaurants. We had the Pestos Yet to Come, which is really cute. And definitely something that Jimmy Pesto from Bob's Burgers would use. We have Ziti of Stars, Cake Canaveral, Knish from a Rose, Biscotti Pippin. <laughs> no, it's Scotty Pippin. It's Biscotti Pippin. Oh! Scotty Pippin's a basketball oh! player. Oh, that makes so much sense. I thought it was trying to say, like, hot and piping. <laughs> that makes so much more sense. Biscotti Pippin. Right. Okay. Beignet and the Jets. Crawler Intentions. That one's... I like that one. That's cute. Steak on a stick with a sign for extra sticks. Hot dog on a stick on a stick. Bagel on a stick. Yeah, and we see a guy walking by with three bagels on a stick. Like, what are you going to do with three bagels? That's a lot of bread. Yeah, but eat all of them. But that's a lot of bread. Why? What's wrong with bread? Bread makes you fat. Bread makes you fat? (laughs) We get caviar on a stick, which I love. That's my favorite one. The sign just has the little individual (laughs) pieces of caviar. That would be torture to have to put those on the stick every day. Oh my god, I know. I hope that Eleanor had to work there for whatever reason. (laughs) Just for the afternoon, she was subbing in. Oh, you don't think it's like you bring your stick and you have to poke your own caviar? Oh, that would suck too. We also get Sushi and the Banshees and Ponzu Scheme. There's a whole list on Twitter. Of all the unused ones? Yeah, of all the unused ones, and uh, we'll get to that. (laughs) There's some really great puns. Megan Amram did a great job. Which would be your favorite of these neighborhoods? The Italian-themed one, the on-a-stick one, or the dessert one? Um, dessert one? Mm. Definitely not the clam chowder one. Jeez, I guess we're not going to end up in the same neighborhood because I would totally take the Italian one. Are you kidding me? you go for the dessert any day of the week. Mm-mm, pasta. You'd never be able to have ice cream? Pasta. I assume that this Italian neighborhood has gelato. And also cannolis and other Italian-themed goods. Okay, that's fair. So, I'm good. So, throughout this sequence, I did notice that Tahani and Chidi are never the ones that realize that they're in the bad place. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, they still think every single time that they are meant to be here. Of course. That they belong in the good place. Yeah. It's kind of sad. They're full of themselves a little bit. Well, it's just kind of sad that they clearly aren't learning, right? If if Eleanor never met Tahani or Chidi, they would consistently believe they were in the good place. There mm. would be no reason for them not to think that. So, But it's a little weird, even after all the signs that other people see, why don't they ever figure it out? Because they led good lives in their own head. Eleanor is, she has no reservations. Like, she knows that she didn't lead a good life. Mm. Jason knows he did not. Right. And we know from season one that she doesn't actually feel like she belongs. Yeah. And in attempt 649, when Jason figures it out and Michael says, this is real low point, that this one hurts. And then he clutches his stomach. I think he's got a cheaty stomach ache. Ooh, ooh, yeah. man. So he's experiencing some of the side effects. Oh, yeah. That's fantastic. Oh, I love that. Jason figured it out? Oh. Oh, this is a real low point. <laughs> <laughs> And Jason's so proud of himself. I love it. Okay, shall we continue? In attempt number 802, the demons go on strike. Vicky presents their demands to Michael and blackmails him. Chidi and Eleanor take a break from studying to get some clam chowder, and they discover they're in the bad place. Joined by Janet, the three of them go to the medium place. Mindy tells them they've already been there 15 times. So the demons are on strike. Yes, I like this. Yep. It really does feel more and more like a corporation, like you've said before. Mm -hmm. This idea that they're going on strike. It's kind of like Vicky is their union representative. And she has a list of demands and she's trying to negotiate something. It's fun. I like it. It's really good. And it also validates what I said last episode. Which is? Vicky wants Michael's job. Yes. Yes, definitely. So that, I think, is where this next batch of episodes is going to be headed Mm -hmm. clam chowder fountain ew just the idea of anything being in a fountain just open to the air bugs there's no bugs in the good place uh, well in this one there probably is that's and even if it's not it's just it's gross it just seems so unsanitary 
And I have no opinions on clam chowder because it's been so long since I've eaten it that I just don't know if it's good or not. Ugh. <laughs> I mean, it looks really gross. Ugh. So gross. <laughs> and silly Cheaty actually goes to take some. Ugh, Cheaty, I'm questioning your life choices right now. Yeah, Eleanor's description of clam chowder is eerily accurate in my mind. A savory latte with bugs in it. Ugh. Ugh. Hot ocean milk with dead animal croutons. Okay, all of that is Ugh. just disgusting. <laughs> I wrote in my notes that was gross times two. Oh, yeah, it really is. When we see the demons, or when Eleanor and Chidi see the demons smoking their cigars and the other one comes over and Todd. he's like that lava monster guy... It's so interesting to think that they're all in human suits Mm -hmm. or that a lot of them are in human suits. Yeah, you don't really realize that that's what they are because they're all just humans. Yeah. It looks like they're all just people. I wonder if we're going to get more of that. Maybe later on in the season or perhaps in the next season, Mm -hmm. if we're going to start to see them take off those human suits. Super creepy. This show isn't a show full of CGI Mm -hmm. or computer generated elements. Uh, so when we do see it, it's it's kind of, I don't know, it's almost like a shock for me. Yeah. When we see the mean giraffes in the earlier part of the, the episode, they're they're not very well done. But it still is, is weird to see in such a, a sitcom-y feel of a show that right. you don't really ever see CG in that. So it's, it's great. If we do see it in the future, it'll... It'll feel weird. I don't know if I'm explaining myself well enough, but it's it feels off, but right. in like a good way. Off and uncomfortable in yeah. the way that the bad place should make you feel. Right. right. Okay, cool. And we go back to see Mindy. Oh Yay. man, I'm so excited to see her again. And Ugh. we actually squashed another fan theory yeah. by going to see Mindy that she's in on it and we find out that she's not. No. I mean, we're like 99.9% sure that she's not at this point. Yeah, we're pretty darn sure she's not. Yeah. Although, I mean, it's not totally squashed, It's not right? completely. There's still that 0.1% chance. Yeah. But. I think I think it's just all real. I think she's really there to help them. And they really have been there 15 times. Mm-hmm. I believe it. I take Mindy on her word. As soon as Eleanor and Janet and Chidi arrive at Mindy's house in the medium place, you can see how exasperated Mindy is. Like, oh, oh, great, yeah. it's you guys again. And they've been there 15 times before, and this is attempt number 802. Mm -hmm. So every 53 resets, they make it to the medium place. It's kind of crazy it's not more often than that. Mm -hmm. It's a little depressing. then again, some of his attempts have been very quick. Yes. Lasted only a day, an hour, didn't even last long enough to tell her that she was supposed to be in the good place. Mm -hmm. So some of these attempts did not go well. No. And the first time around in season one, it took us a while to get to the medium place. So depending on the length of the attempts, it makes sense, I guess. Exactly. I like that Mindy's memory is not affected. It seems like Michael still has no idea, even after these 15 times, that she exists Mm -hmm. or that she's even met the core four. Maybe Michael's omnipotence doesn't reach outside of his neighborhood. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. And I like that Mindy is this sort of safe haven. I guess that could lend to either theory, really. It could work in favor of Mindy being real and the, and the medium place being real. Or it could work in the favor of Mindy is actually one of Michael's employees. Mm-hmm. I'm still firmly on team Mindy is real. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. It just seems to make sense with Janet being the only one to be able to control the train mm-hmm. and heading over there. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Janet in the train... Do we see an example of her personhood? She says, aren't trains neat? Choo-choo. Oh, so she likes something. She likes something. She's stating an opinion of her own. Oh, yeah. So huh. despite all these resets, these 802 resets, is she learning still? Is she learning more at an extremely slow snail's pace? Hmm. Well, I do think it's a point for her personhood. For sure. Mm -hmm. She's expressing an opinion about something that she likes. Mm -hmm. She's having opinions about things. She's not just, all right, we're here. She goes, aren't trains neat? Choo-choo. And that's so cute. It's very sweet. Yeah, we don't get a lot of development for Janet in this episode. Or anybody. Or, well, we get some development from others, but not very much, no. As soon as they meet Mindy, they start to show some development. Yes, definitely. 
just before we head into their visit uh, with Mindy, I want to talk a little bit more about Vicky's meeting with Michael. I really like the line, you might even get the Jared from Subway account. Oh, gosh. Not only because that's just a great reference. It's it's so unexpected, but so funny, and yet so creepy, I Mm -hmm. guess. But I really like it because... I just keep getting all these hints that this is like this huge corporation and they're kind of like all competing for the same thing. They're all competing for these different accounts. They want to be able to inflict the most torture to Mm -hmm. the worst people. Right. So people like Chidi and Tahani would actually be undesirable accounts, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they think that they're good people, but they're not that bad. So... Is it really going to feel that great torturing them? Exactly. Or is it going to feel so great torturing someone like Jared from Subway, who's a scumbag? Right. You know? Yeah. So I think it's fun. Yeah. I just imagine like file folders with the names on them. Like, oh, here you go. Here are his stats. And this is one of the things that he hates. And this is why he's here. So go to town. Yeah. And you got to prove yourself. Go up the ladder at this uh, bad place incorporated. Yeah, like after a thousand years, we're going to check in and see how miserable he is. And if he's super miserable, then you might get a promotion. Ooh, fun. Might throw in another person in there. <laughs> Give you access to our second level of torture devices. Ooh. And I really want to see Vicky's take. I really do. I'm hoping that's where this is going. It's just going to be so interesting to see her kind of lead things. And what she's going to do. Because she says she's got all these ideas. She's been, you know, compiling ideas because he's been failing for so long. It's going to be good. I don't think we're going to see it. No? Because that would mean they would have to be reset once again. Nope. I don't think so. Well, she said next reset, I'm doing it. I'm doing it my way. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. But I don't don't think think we're actually going to reset. I think he's going to pretend. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Actually, that theory comes from from our listener, Kate. I do human things on Twitter. She said, I imagine the trick will be full wiping them so that they can undermine Vicky's and the others' schemes. I really like that. Yeah, I'm hoping that that's what happened. Kate, that sounds so good. That sounds wonderful Mm because that's like... Because we would get to see Vicky's attempt, right? Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't have to do a reset again. So everything that happened at Mindy's place really happened and Eleanor knows about it Chidi knows about it mm-hmm. everybody knows about it I think it would be so good that would be great uh-huh that's what I want give me that I would not be surprised if that's how it turned out yeah I really would not be and the candidate for the worst joke of the series is probably Vicky's down under line down whatever. under oh, down God. under it's so bad are you kidding she really nailed that Australian accent oh no <laughs> It's not even that the accent is bad. It's It's bad. It's just a bad joke. It's such a bad accent, too. Mm, That's so bad. Okay, yeah. Least favorite joke in the episode. I just, I didn't laugh. I just cringed. I think that's the point. Uh, Okay. Well, they succeeded then. Yeah. (laughs) Mindy tells them about their previous visits and shows Eleanor and Chidi a list of their previous plans. In a bind, Michael bounces ideas off Jason. Frustrated by Chidi, Eleanor vents to Mindy, who shows her a video of Eleanor and Chidi in bed, confessing their love for each other. <laughs> You're like, she's... I'm just, I'm just Vivian smiling. is smiling Sorry, right now. I'm just smiling. Okay, before we get to all of the smiling parts, I love Mindy. I just love her. She's so funny. And she's so effortlessly funny, too. And I love her explanation of why they keep going back. Well, sometimes you go back because... I walk in on you while I'm masturbating. Oh my gosh. I <laughs> Mary Beth Monroe is hilarious. Her face is perfect all she, the time. She, her <laughs> delivery for those lines are so good. And her facial expressions, just everything adds up to weird person mm-hmm. who's just a little uncomfortable and off-putting. And yeah. And yet watching her is fantastic it's golden don't think i'd want to be in the same room as her but you know removed is good yeah. <laughs> so some of the previous plans include physically attack michael stab with small knife find michael's boss blackmail drug him seduce michael throw tahani under the bus stab with large knife make michael think he's the one in the bad place 
indecent proposal him, Shawshank our way out, <laughs> try to stuff Michael back into his magic lamp. I think that's another one of Jason's suggestions. Yep, probably. So he's got two on the board. Mm. Find Ray Donovan, but an angel. So I'd never watched Ray Donovan, and I looked it up, and I guess he's a person who arranges bribes, payoffs, threats, and other shady activities to ensure the outcome that is desired by his client. Mm-hmm. Kind of like a hitman, but also he does other stuff on the side, Okay, is what it sounds like. Okay. So find Ray Donovan, but an angel, so someone who can help them. Yeah. Someone who can fix things for them. Uh, the other plans were catch that magic panda, use her powers, which we know is Jason's. We also have find Doug Forsett. Mm-hmm. And that's a callback to our first episode of the series, where Michael tells us about Doug Forsett, who had the closest guess about the ast- about the afterlife, mm-hmm. which I really like that one. I wonder if that's a possibility. Like if we ever meet him? Yeah. That would be neat. That would be cool. And the last one is hard to see, but I'm pretty sure it's just Eleanor turns self in, which we already know would not work. Yeah. All of them would need to turn themselves in, and then that just defeats the whole point. Yep. Okay. So it's fun. I'm glad that we get to see that they've had other plans that, you know, they've thought of different options before, but we can also see that they're kind of running out of options. Mm Mm-hmm. Like Especially they've... having Jason's ideas on there. Yeah, not so good. Now, Eleanor mentions this idea of the even worse place when she's <laughs> getting frustrated with Chidi. And I kind of wonder, is that possible? I doubt it. I don't think that they're going to explore that. I just think there'd be different layers of bad mm-hmm. place. Just like bad places that are just a bit worse or yeah. they have harder residents that are... Difficult to count. Right. Okay. Or accounts that require more torture. More manpower. Sure. Demon power. Or super <laughs> bad people that just get double the torture because they're that much worse. Okay. Yeah. More service. Mm-hmm. Double the service. We know that this is the only version of the bad place slash the good place. There's only This is the only neighborhood of employees torturing four people. Mm-hmm. So I doubt the bad place is actually like a neighborhood. Yeah. I see it as just like, I don't know, a hallway. It's like a prison with different jail cells and each one gets its own personal torture device. Yeah. I don't know. Something like that. It's sort of like a guess guess what's behind door number two. And door number two might have, you know, an isolated wasteland where the person is always by themselves except for two moments of the day where they're being skinned alive right whatever something fun like that yeah what's behind door number three that kind of thing Mm -hmm. okay but i don't think it's very creative because we know that the demons don't do creative things yeah they twist them they burn them alive that kind of thing. right exactly okay a few people took this as canon when she said it like oh i bet i went to the even worse place i think it's just her being silly oh yeah it's just eleanor And saying, like, I'm aware that this bad place is not actually that bad, so I'm pointing that out. Mm -hmm. By saying that there should be a difference between the hell that people like me go to and the hell that people like serial killers go to. Or Jared from Subway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We'll lump him in with those guys. All right, so let's get to the part of the episode where my ears perked up. Chidi says... We are trapped in a warped version of Nietzsche's eternal recurrence. Don't you see the problem? We are experiencing karma, but we can't learn from our mistakes because our memories keep getting erased. It's an epistological nightmare. Well, Chidi has never watched Memento. Oh, yeah? Well, we're taught that sometimes you can learn through repetition. Mm. And I believe we've discussed this several times before. Yeah, we have. We've talked about... The characters fundamentally being changed from their experience in season one. Right. Learning through instinct. Mm -hmm. Repetition begets instinct. Yes, but in Memento, the guy has a lot of help. Yes. Right? He lives his life from post-it notes. Yes. Tattoos. Exactly. Post-it notes, tattoos, um, pictures. Yes. And even then, he's not always right about everything. Mm Mm-hmm. So I just want to dive into this concept of Nietzsche's eternal recurrence. 
And I'm going to do this by quoting an episode of True Detective, which is a great show and kind of explores this idea. Matthew McConaughey's character says, It's like, in this universe, we process time linearly, forward, but outside of our space-time, from what would be a fourth-dimensional perspective, time wouldn't exist. And from that vantage, could we attain it, we'd see our space-time would look flattened, like a single sculpture of matter in a superposition of every place it ever occupied. Our sentience just cycling through our lives like carts on a track. See, everything outside our dimension, that's eternity. Eternity is looking down on us. Now to us, it's a sphere, but to them, it's a circle. So this idea that Michael and all the other demons are outside of this time, right? Because they have this power to reset everything over and over and over again. But from the perspective of... Eleanor and Chidi and everyone else, this is all new, but it's just cycling over and over and over again. They're just carts on this same track. Mm -hmm. Nietzsche's eternal reoccurrence is actually just a thought experiment, but it's an experiment to judge whether or not you're living a worthwhile life. So imagine that your life ends at this very moment and someone says to you that you're going to live this life over and over and over again for eternity. Every single moment, every little moment of boredom, every joy, every pain, every heartache. Would it be a blessing or would it be a curse? So he's asking people to... If it's a curse, then you want to reevaluate your life and change the direction that you're going. Exactly. Yeah. And if it's a blessing, then you're on the right path. Exactly. So that actually reminds me a lot of a movie that recently came out called Arrival. It deals with time not being linear. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the language that they're trying to decipher in that film looks a lot like the Ouroboros of the snake circle eating its own tail. Yes. In a never ending cycle. Mm -hmm. So I thought that's very interesting. Yeah, definitely. And that quote from True Detective very succinctly explains and describes a lot of the thoughts and themes of that movie which is a fantastic movie. And if you haven't seen it, you should probably watch it. And if you have seen it and didn't like it, you should probably watch it again. (laughs) I think maybe you're talking to someone specific, but I can't tell. (laughs) No, 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 no. So when Chidi says that he feels like they're trapped in this warped version of Nietzsche's eternal recurrence, to me that means that he realizes things are different every time. Or at least they're different most of the time. Because if they were the same... They would always end up at Mindy's place. Yeah, it wouldn't be 15 times out of 800. It's possible that he thinks, oh, there's only ever been 15 times. But judging by from what Mindy says and how she acts, it seems like they don't go there that often. Mm -hmm. So it would be really frightening. And I think it probably is frightening to him to know that there's been other times that he just can't remember. Yeah, that would be terrifying to think that this could have happened before. Mm Mm-hmm. Or how many times has this happened before? Yeah. Like, that's a brain-wrinkling moment. Oh, definitely. Which is why I think he's like, I'm just, I don't even know what to do. I feel completely stuck because this this idea of the eternal recurrence, you would be reliving your life exactly the way it has been lived for eons. But would you know? Nothing would change. Right. Would you know? No. But the idea that he knows that things are off, it's like, oh... It's now just I having, really don't know. Right. It's just having that knowledge mm-hmm. that it has happened before is really messing with them. It's interesting how he takes that information over Eleanor. Yeah. She just doesn't care. No. She's like, okay, I've got to make a plan. Right. We she's have to a person of action. We exactly. know this. And Chidi just overthinks everything. Yeah. Oh, definitely. So the two of them work well together. They need to combine their skills. Definitely. The next thing that Chidi says is we are experiencing karma, but we can't learn from our mistakes because our memories keep getting erased. Now, a lot of people think of karma as, you know, you're a bad person. Well, you're going to get that karma. It's going to come back to you. This whole idea of you reap what you sow. But really, karma just means action. So they're experiencing events happening. They're making choices they are completing actions but they don't get to remember any of that Mm -hmm. so i don't think it's kind of a reap what you sow type of thing in his mind right and then chidi also says it's an epistemological nightmare 
And in case you don't know what epistemology is, it's a branch of philosophy concerned with the theory of knowledge. Uh, They study the nature of knowledge, justification, and the rationality of belief. So epistemology addresses such questions as what makes justified beliefs justified? What does it mean to say that one knows something? And how do we know what we know? So this idea of knowledge and and uh, all the questions surrounding it, which is so interesting. And of course, is why Chidi is completely freaking out at this moment. Because how does he know what he knows? If he, if he doesn't know what his past self knows, or does the knowledge that his past self know go anywhere? Like, does it go? He's living an epistemological nightmare. Yeah. What is truth? What is anything? What is knowledge? Man, it's... uh... Sucks to be cheaty. Yeah, it is quite the nightmare. (laughs) Maybe ignorance really is bliss. Yeah, and in this case, (laughs) it might help. It might help. All right. So that was our philosophy 10 minutes or however long that was. Let's get back to the episode. So Jason... Most of our listeners can probably assume how I felt about the VHS. How did you feel? Well, I saw your reaction when we watched the episode live. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm asking how you felt. I, 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 I think I don't they know. can even just tell from my tone of voice right now. I guess now. <laughs> I was surprised. I guess I wasn't really surprised. It was really neat to see that they got together. Mm. And it was interesting to find out that they got together several times. Mm. Eight out of the 15 times that they were there. Yeah, um, I want to ask you about the... I want to ask you about what Mindy says. Okay. She says, they got together eight different days, but 20 different sessions. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what that means. Does that mean that they hooked up eight different days, but multiple times per day? Yes, that's what I assume. 20 different sex sessions. It's impressive. Yeah. Way to go. So that's more than twice each of those eight days. Mm Mm-hmm. They really got it bad, like they, Mindy says. Exactly. They got it bad for each other. So Mindy definitely ships Eleanor and Chidi. Oh, yeah. Eleanor says, but he's just a friend. Like, like I barely know the guy. Mm-hmm. And Mindy says, no, Eleanor, you guys have known each other a really long time. And I think that's a very important line mm-hmm. for Eleanor to hear because she doesn't realize how long she's actually known Chidi for. Right. And we know that it's at least 800 days. So taking, doing a little bit of loose math, <laughs> like rough estimating, I did a little math. I thought on average, perhaps each session or each attempt was 20 days on average. Okay. That means that they had been in the bad place for 44 years. Wow. Yeah. So we know that some attempts lasted much longer than... 20 days mm-hmm. some attempts lasted much less but i'm i'm trying to do a little bit of rough estimating here like 20 seemed like a good number okay i did see a couple of posts online on reddit and on tumblr of people trying to figure out okay exactly how long have they been in the afterlife mm-hmm. and really the answers varied from anywhere from three years to 55 years depending on how generous you feel like being with the attempts right But we know it's been years. Yes. And it's more likely, I think, that it's been at least in the double digits. Mm -hmm. It's got to have been at least 10 years. Yeah, for sure. So that's a long time for those demons not to get mad. It's a scary thought, too. that They've been in this neighborhood for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And they feel like they've only been there for, what version is this? Uh, 802. And so they're a week in. So they've only, they feel like they've only been there for seven days. Yeah. When it's been years. Mm hmm. That would mess so much with my head. Yeah, it's, oh, it's scary. Man. Yeah. See, as much as I like that line from Mindy where she says that they've known each other for a really long time, Eleanor doesn't remember that. So despite having seen this on video, I'm just wondering how it's going to change things in the future between her and Chidi. Now that she has this knowledge that they've been together before, that she at one point genuinely loved him and Mm -hmm. said it and he loved her back, is she going to feel like, oh, I should love him now? Like, that's sort of a thing that I wonder about because imagine you were to lose your memory Mm -hmm. of maybe a year or two 
And in that year or two, you had fallen in love with somebody. So you wake up from this coma, I guess, that you're in. And someone says, oh, I'm your boyfriend or I'm your girlfriend. And we've been together for this this time. And look at all of these memories that we have together. And we loved each other. Mm -hmm. Would that mean anything to you? Or would you just feel a certain ache in your heart because you don't love them? And or you have to learn to love them again. I don't know. Yeah, it it's, just yeah, it makes me sad more than anything. It's a scary question. And I mean, there is a great movie that mm -hmm. has that idea of fifty first dates with Adam Sandler and yep. Drew Barrymore. Mm -hmm. We learn that through all these discussions with Mindy and all these sequences that we see, Eleanor always ends up with Chidi as a friend or mm -hmm. as a companion or something. They find each other. They find each time. other. Yeah. They're always gonna find each other. Which I think is really sweet. It's but, just every single time is going to be a bit different. Yeah, right? but with this knowledge, does that make her um, feel any different? Mm -hmm. Because she yeah. probably didn't have that knowledge all those other times. So exactly. now that she's been presented with this videotape, that's going to really mess with things. Yeah. And Chidi doesn't know. Will she tell Chidi? Yeah. Will she show him the videotape? Will she try to just avoid it entirely? Mm -hmm. I'm interested to see what they're going to do. Because I know you want them to end up together. Well, yeah. So you want them to be happy together. Yeah. So it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be strange. Yeah. I did really like this moment. It caught me completely off guard. I was not expecting to see a romantic moment between Chidi and Eleanor this early on mm -hmm. in the, the series, really, or just this season. But I think it's really sweet. We have both Chidi and Eleanor who've never been in love before. Because we learned last season that Chidi's never really had a serious relationship. And we know that Eleanor was way too selfish uh, before her death. So it's nice to see that they're experiencing this important moment together. Yeah. And we get to see in this video that this attempt they were in, they got to experience a lot of personal growth together. Yeah, we don't know how long it was until they slept together. Mm -hmm. It could be, you it know, a month. It could have been yeah. years. It could have been an attempt that lasted 300 days. It could yeah. have been an attempt that lasted 600 days, but yeah. failed. I think it's really sweet that Eleanor is capable of very genuinely saying that she loves him. And Chidi, without any hesitation, is able to say it back. Mm -hmm. Which I think is so important. But what's also important is that Eleanor doesn't ask him to say it back. She knows that things are difficult for him. She knows mm -hmm. it's not easy for him to just say his feelings. And I just, I love that moment. It just shows that they know each other so well and that that love is really real. Yeah. And it's really sad to think that those two people, those versions of them, got it ripped away from them. Oh, I just made myself really sad. Oh, yeah, anyway. those those people don't exist anymore. Yeah, see, that's the part that breaks my heart a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. I know that this was like a really happy moment for a lot of people, and it was for me too. But then I thought a little bit more about it, and I got myself sad. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned Memento earlier, and I wonder if one of their plans could just have been to Memento Michael. Maybe that's what Eleanor's plan was when she took the VHS tape from Mindy. What do you mean, Memento Michael? Or, like, to to Memento themselves so that they could defeat Michael. So, like, write on themselves? Yeah, like, if could you tattoo yourself in the good place? Hmm. It's not like he's stripping them naked. Right. He wouldn't be able to see if Eleanor had written, or if Eleanor had had tattooed, you're actually in the bad place on her stomach. Right. Or on her thigh. You know, or maybe the VHS is some kind of memento and maybe Eleanor thinks she'll be able to take it with her if she gets reset. It's not like she's going to be able to. Well, she could try and stuff it down Janet's throat. We did <laughs> see that Michael could put his entire arm down there. I don't think so. that trick's going to work anymore. Do you think Michael's checking down her throat every time he resets? Maybe. Maybe. That's gross. Poor Janet. So anyway, that's just... That was one of my thoughts. Like, hey, she's taking the VHS probably because it's gross that Mindy has one. I think that's why she took it. So Mindy wouldn't have it anymore. Mm, yeah. Oh, no. Stop. It's my only copy. <laughs> that was a great line. Yeah, I feel like there's going to be a lot that happens with that VHS. Yes. Yeah. I'm excited to see what they uh, what happens with it. Okay. Eleanor takes the VHS from Mindy, and she, Janet, and Chidi head back to the good place. 
Jason gives Michael some unexpectedly good advice, and the core four confront Michael, and he offers to team up with them. Mm. New best friends. New best friends. I love his smile after that because it's still very creepy. If you go back, you watch that one moment, it's not, oh, look, we're happy to be best friends. It's, we're going to be best friends and I'm still going to torture you. I think it's because he has no other choice. Yeah. And he knows that they have no other choice. Mm -hmm. So today I went back and I listened to part of our last episode for season one. And Lonnie rightly predicted this whole thing. She said that Michael would need the core four to remember and that he would need their help to get out of whatever trouble he's in so they'd end up working together. And here we are, episode three. Boom! Lonnie, you were so right! Nailed it! High five! I wish that was actually Lonnie I was high fiving. (laughs) No offense to you, but... (laughs) So man, this is so great. I'm so excited. Personally, I believe that episode four will be the start of where this season is going to begin Mm -hmm. like showing us what's actually going to take place yeah fingers crossed yeah this is one of those very unique network shows where you really don't know where things are gonna go and we have no idea yeah and it's so much fun to not be able to know in a way it's it's really a lot of fun to theorize and to have all this suspense Mm -hmm. build up every week it's it's a lot of fun with a show that's so unpredictable definitely I really wonder if this is how people watching Lost felt. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah? sure it was. Okay. Did you feel this way when you were watching Lost? You I did started, watch part of it live. I did. I watched. I started watching Lost live in season two halfway through. So I definitely had no idea where the show was going after every episode. Okay. Yeah. This really feels like I'm getting to experience Lost style theorizing and Mm -hmm. and uh suspense for sure so what did you think of jason's story i was confused by it (laughs) i don't think jason knew what he was saying Mm. but it was dope right it was dope the end i don't know by jason mendoza (laughs) (laughs) what what i mean is i don't think jason realized that his story would have relevance to what michael was asking and i think the main lesson is just Using an alternative method to solve a problem. Don't use the obvious method. Right. Think outside the box. Yeah. So the obvious method from Jason's story would just be to band together and dance really well. To train hard and show them up. Right? But instead the alternative method was slashing their tires. Mm Mm-hmm. Which isn't elegant, but will work. Gets the job done. Exactly. And while I was listening to that episode as well... I noticed that Jason predicted we would see a lot of resets this season. I thought that there would only be one or two. I was very wrong. I think I was also pretty wrong. By me saying a lot of resets, I I think I only meant like, I don't know, maybe 10, 15. Not 800. Not 802. Mm. But I still predicted resets. You did. And you said a lot. You did not specify. You could have taken that one and just accepted it. But no, you've got to be, like, accurate and humble. (laughs) So, yeah, I think this is a great direction for the show to go in. I think it's going to be a lot of fun to see him team up with them and for them to sort of figure out, okay, how are we going to work together? Because Mm -hmm. we clearly have opposing goals. The core four don't want to be tortured. Michael wants to torture them. Are they going to be able to find some of the same goals right because michael wants to torture them but michael also wants his plan to succeed Mm -hmm. so what does he want more he wants his plan to succeed yeah because he wants recognition in the workplace but maybe he will put that aside for a little while so he doesn't end up getting retired Mm -hmm. so episode four episode four vicky's downfall (laughs) it's gonna be a lot of fun yeah i'm very interested to see where it'll go All you lovely people sent us great letters, great messages, some mail, and we'd like to discuss all those submissions. Yeah, I didn't find any notes in my mouth, though, so I'm a little disappointed in you guys. But before we dive into the mailbag... We've got a song in our hearts and also in our podcast. (laughs) All All we want to do is share share our thoughts thoughts with you about your your emails, emails, about your emails. Our first message comes from Christy at a Dana girl on Twitter. She said, what Kristen Bell should know about finding hidden sex cams from her Veronica Mars days. 
You're darn right she should. Damn, damn right, man. Her memory was probably wiped, though. Yeah. Mindy, you shouldn't do that. People shouldn't have to find your hidden sex cams because you shouldn't have hidden sex cams, you weirdos. Or just hide them better. Or just don't. Don't, ha- don't or, have or them. Don't. don't have them. <laughs> she also asked, why didn't the Eleanor and Tahani ship work out? I think we already discussed that. Yeah, I really just don't think that they're a great match. I don't think it would have lasted long enough. Yeah, I think they would have just gotten on each other's nerves too quickly and figured it out that this was the bad place. I'm sure there were several other attempts with the other members. So he probably went through a bunch of the good place employees. Yeah, why not try every combo and then eventually get to a dog? Yeah, I think that was his last ditch effort. (laughs) I think so too. Our next message comes from Garrett at GarrettCRW on Twitter. He said, is it possible that the good place is doing the whole body remembering what the mind has forgotten thing that the dollhouse tried to do? Hmm. Well, it's an interesting thought. If you haven't seen Dollhouse, there's a great Dollhouse podcast out there that you can uh, listen to while you're going along with the series for the first time. It's called Did I Fall Asleep? A Dollhouse podcast. Check it out on iTunes. So I'm not really sure. I don't think so. I don't think so either because that type of body remembering muscle memory type thing doesn't really work for somebody who, I don't know, doesn't have these personalities and experiences injected into them. Mm -hmm. through memories so none of our characters have these ninja skills or personalities implanted into them Mm -hmm. and they're still themselves every time right they're going through different experiences but they're not experiencing an entirely new personality or an entirely new life Mm -hmm. and we're not getting obvious hints that dollhouse did that our characters are remembering from previous events Mm -hmm. we're getting very subtle hints that emotionally morality wise they've changed but not really Mm -hmm. the hints are very subtle not really bigger than that yeah yeah i think if they were going to do it it would be a lot more obvious Mm -hmm. i think so too our next message comes from kathleen hawks at katie hawks on twitter she said i need more janet and more tahani where the hell was tahani in this episode darn right she was very absent Where's Tahani, as Tahani would probably say. (laughs) It's hashtag Tahani time. Right. Maybe that'll be the next episode. We'll get lots of Tahani. Kathleen also had a really interesting theory about Janet. She said, I have a theory about why we saw so much personal growth in Janet the first time we saw her get rebooted, and not quite as much the hundreds of subsequent times, as far as we could tell, because honestly, we don't get to see Janet explore herself very much in this episode explore her soul no none of these philosophers are ever talking about masturbation (laughs) she said i'm not sure exactly what happens in between reboots of the good place we know that it doesn't zoom straight to eleanor waking up in the waiting room right away that they have a little bit of time to reset and replan and it's during this time frame that they are able to reboot janet and give her all the time to upload all the information in the universe My theory is that she changed so much during season one because she was able to interact with the core four during the process of her rebooting. So her updated version was heavily influenced by the human interactions and especially her human interactions with Jason, right? Right. She said, I don't think that progress necessarily has gone away, but I don't think it's as easy to see now that she has had so many less eventful reboots. Right. So she's kind of like a a little bird or an animal that gets influenced by its mother Mm. so the people surrounding it so janet could absorb knowledge from people surrounding her but there are no people surrounding her they're just demons Mm -hmm. she's not having these interactions with jason she's not getting the compassion he gives her and the friendship that he gives her Mm -hmm. it's a very interesting thought yeah i really like that theory i think it's it makes the most sense Um, Thank you so much for that, uh, Kathleen. She also mentioned that Janet wasn't around when Eleanor and Chidi were trying to come up with a new plan in this episode. Mm -hmm. And she was wondering, well, where is she? And she wonders if maybe Eleanor and Chidi didn't want her to be part of the planning process because they still didn't really trust her at this point. And I think that that's likely. I think Chidi is feeling very paranoid and really anxious so i don't think he'd want her around in case 
Michael was using her to listen in or she was part of the plan in some way. Mm -hmm. They haven't gotten to know Janet this time around. Mm -hmm. He hasn't gotten attached to her. So, yeah, I would say that she's just been shunned in this episode. You know, we might, thinking about that, we might find a lot of information in the next episode if our four... If our group of four and Michael are teaming up, maybe they're going to be asking him a lot of questions mm. about how things work, how his powers work, how Janet works. Oh my gosh. So we might so get exciting. some reveals. I hope so. That could be neat to find out a little bit more how Janet works or how Michael's powers work. Mm -hmm. Or I wonder if they would bring up that they went to Mindy's, that they went to the medium place and Michael's like, wait, what? Mm. Just some thoughts to think in your thinker. Hmm. Kathleen also says, this kind of reminds me of how Eleanor and Chidi supposedly find each other over and over again and keep falling for each other in almost every version. Do you think that if somehow reincarnation were possible in this universe, that the core four would always be able to find each other on Earth? I don't think so. Me neither. Because of geography, surprisingly yes. enough. Yes. Um, they all kind of were in the in different places, the closest people were Jason and Eleanor living mm -hmm. in Florida and Arizona specifically. I don't think that they would find each other again, but they might feel a pull or they might feel a sense of loneliness, mm -hmm. like they're missing something. But what I actually really like about Kathleen's comment is that it made me wonder if Michael ever tried an attempt where he didn't tell them that they were dead. Oh. Yeah. Makes them think that. I don't know, they're at a rehab facility. They had a mental breakdown or something. or They woke up from a coma. Or... or he tries to make the good place look like a neighborhood that they used to live in. Somewhere on Earth. Just somehow make it seem like they're still living. They're still alive. Mm -hmm. That would be bizarre. That would be so cool. All right, Kathleen, thank you very much for your emails. Yes, thank you so much. Our last message comes from Kate. I do human things on Twitter. She was the one who said all those comments about faux wiping them so they can undermine Vicky's schemes in the following episodes. But she also said, I'm not sure why the Bad Place actor team has enough loyalty to Michael to blackmail him rather than just tattling so that they can get back to doing whatever they would be doing otherwise. Cigar smoking and shirt talking as far as I've seen. But maybe they have homes? Families? Evil children? Evil sporting events where dead professional athletes play with a ball that looks like the bloody head of the person they, the holder loves most? Hmm. I suppose the snitches get stitches mentality may be in effect. I suppose they might all be out of jobs if they kibosh this whole scheme, but it's hard to imagine that the bad place afterlife is run as a capitalistic venture wherein the demonic residents need to dole out resumes after every completed slash failed idea to make sure they can keep food on the torture racks for their family feedings. Okay, that's fantastic, Kate. That whole, that <laughs> just whole everything, ramble just everything. is I, great. I, we do, Yeah, you should come on our show. Okay. <laughs> she said, do they even need to eat? What on earth motivates them to do this other than pleasure? If they don't enjoy this and they have nothing to lose, other than Michael, what's the point of them carrying on? I'm curious about the social structure. Is Michael more powerful than them all? He's an architect, but what are all of they? Mm hmm Yeah. They're the lackeys. They're the lower demons. Yeah. So... The lesser demons. I feel like these demons are not able to get in contact with Sean. We do have... Uh, in the first episode, we do have Amy Akuda asking Michael, you know, did you tell Sean? I know it's not really any of our business, but did you tell Sean about what happened? So, to me, that kind of implies that they don't have any contact with him. Mm -hmm. Maybe because of their position. Like, he's kind of the CEO kind of person. And they're the lowly employees. So, they're right. not going to speak directly to him. And also that they can't speak to him. So, what about Vicky? With her threat to Michael? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Because Vicky says she's going to tattle basically she's gonna go to sean and yeah why hasn't she done it before it's been 800 attempts mm -hmm. hmm. they're a lot more tolerable they probably live for millions and millions of years so 800 attempts is nothing okay so that's what you think it is it's not that they can't 
Or it's not that they don't report to Sean. So... Oh, I think it's both. I think okay. I think the the demons, the employees are a lot. They don't feel time the same way we do, so it doesn't feel like as long for them. Mm-hmm. They're not getting. I mean, they're getting frustrated, obviously, but not as much as maybe we would for eight hundred attempts. Right. But I also think that they do not report to Sean. They can't. They wouldn't. Sean wouldn't listen to them anyway. Like, Mm -hmm. you wouldn't listen to a little bug on the street if it tried to talk to you. Well, I don't know. A talking bug? You wouldn't even be able to hear it. (laughs) That's true. But the point is, I don't think that Sean would listen to them or that they can report to Sean. However, Vicky might have a way. Mm. I don't know. She seems like she's almost the leader. Yeah, she's the union representative. Right, she's the union rep. (laughs) Yeah, okay. Well... Thank you for those thoughts, Kate. Mm-hmm. Thanks a lot. And our last comment comes from Jano Lantern at JLMO on Twitter. She says, petition for a bonus section of Forking Bullshirt where you read all of these deadpan. And then she sent us a link of all of Megan Amram's restaurant puns. <laughs> so stay tuned. We'll read some of those. That brings us to the end of Fork and Bullshirt, a Multiverse Radio production. And we want to hear your thoughts because... As you just heard, we read your thoughts. Yeah. So send them in. Write us a note. Put it in Janet's mouth. Or better yet, you can find us on Twitter at Multiverse Radio. And you can use the hashtag FBullshirt. We're also on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. And you can email us directly from our website, multiverseradio.ca. And you can also find me on Twitter at Slayers, the. We'll see you next week for our review of Season 2, Episode 4, Team Cockroach. And you can only imagine what that episode's going to be about. I hope we don't actually see cockroaches. Oh, I hope we see a whole team of them. Just more like, hey, they're like cockroaches. They will never die. No, they're like cockroaches to Michael. They're bugs to Michael. Mm. They're the ants on the sidewalk no, I, I was just talking about. I yep. think it's nope. the resilience. Mic drop. Nope, I think it's resilience. All right, fine. I challenge you. We're going to watch this episode in a couple days. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye. She said, I wonder if the soulmates... <laughs> the ruse mates? <laughs> mates. <laughs> Is that what Tohani and Eleanor were? Ugh. Anyway, okay. We are experiencing karma, but we can't fucking do this podcast! Dang it! Okay. I told you to practice your lines, but you didn't listen to me, so skunk it! <laughs> skunk it? Skunk it. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> okay, Jan, we're going to try and do this as deadpan as possible. Do not expect good results. <laughs> All right. Some pasta restaurants. Al dente on the Western Front. I don't get that one. Do you get it? What is it? It's uh, All's Quiet on the Western Front. Oh. I think it's um, a movie. Okay. Penne for your thoughts. That's cute. Pasta. No comments. Ex- sorry. You just have to okay. read them. All right. Just reading them. Al dente on the Western Front. Penne for your thoughts. Pasta expiration date. <laughs> Dead pan. I'm trying. Pasta test. Oh my god. Ramen on empty. Ramen with scissors. Return of the Mac. And she's deadpan. <laughs> You're try. so bad at I know, deadpan. I'm, okay, mm, I'm gnocchiing around. <laughs> the pesto's yet to come. ZD lights. ZD of stars. Willie Lomain. Spitzel's needs. J Paul spaghetti. Kara gnocchi. You do the hokey gnocchi, and you eat yourself some food. Lasagna come out. <laughs> hey, deadpan. You don't own me. Own me. Okay. Who don? Udon own me. Linguini Manuel Miranda. <laughs> the apple doesn't farfalle from the tree. <laughs> okay. That one was really good. All right, you go. Some pastry restaurants. Cake cod. Cake Canaveral. Hertz Donut. (laughs)
Donut, you want me, baby. Donut, make my brown eyes blue. Crueler intentions. The fertile croissant. Eclair and present danger. <laughs> Philo and Otis. <laughs> Philo Yiannopoulos. Macaroni Mara. Pie another day. Pie hard. Mm. Pie ant word. That was good. <laughs> Strudel the fence. The strudel is real. Goofus and Galate. Puff piece. Try puff pastry. Cute. Quiche from a rose. Niche from a rose. Beignet and the jets. Muffin but net. Biscotti mm. pippin. Biscotti and meatballs. Bun in the oven. I toured I saw a putty tat. Oh my god. Oh my god, that one's so bad. Okay, I'm not crying. It's fine. Okay. Some corn restaurants. Oh my god, everything's on a cob! <laughs> run! Run! <laughs> Polenta to go around. Kiss my grits, then eat them. The maze runter, runner. Fuck. The maze runner. The maze from Westworld. <clears throat> corn you dig it. Tie corn on the cob. Grand corn nation. Suffering succotash, imperfect hominy, hominy kareen, Colonel Sanders. Oh boy. Some sushi restaurants. So sushi. Tamago never dies. Row, row, row your boat. Take my tempura? Sure. Tuna piano. Rice to meet you. For goodness sake. Miso- misogyny. <laughs> Salmon... Salmon bowl lector. <laughs> Seaweed rabbit. Chopsticks are for kids. <laughs> oh my god, that was so bad. The catcher in the rice. The ketchup in the rice. Ponzu scheme. Oh boy. Some bread restaurants. Toast of the town. Toast the rainbow. Loaf of my life. Second to none. Pita bread. Peter Pan? Peter Pan? Oh, Peter Pan. We Chibata Zoo. <laughs> we bought a zoo. Oh, okay. Brioche with death. Paint brioche. Crouton, a hot tin roof. Massachusetts, a place you can sit and eat matzah. White baguette fences. Last but not yeast. Yeast infect uh, yum. Oh, boy. Yeast infectium, focaccia red-handed, bread pit. <laughs> Some poultry restaurants. Squab goals, chicken of the sea of the land, chicken. Pot pie the sailor man, wings Martin- Martindale, wings Martindale, hot cock au vin, <laughs> cock au vin le doux. Oh my god, cockle doodle do. Oh, I thought it was Cockle like... Van'll do. Ralph Lauren Polo. Water Polo. Duck. Duck, duck, goose. Party fowl. A bird in the hand is worth two in your mouth. <laughs> a view to a quail. Quail yourself. I can be your feather figure. Chicken Corbin Bleu. Bleu. Chicken Corbin Bleu. Picada Good Recipe from the Cookbook. Oh my god, those ones are uh, not the best. Sorry, Megan. Sorry. Squab goals is cute. Duck, duck, goose. Cute. A bird in the hand is worth two in your mouth. Also cute. Some cheese restaurants. Forever in blue cheese. Provolone again naturally. Fondue diligence. Brie larceny. Colby maybe. (laughs) (laughs) Colby maybe. Oh god. Okay. Good enough. Cheddar off dead. Cheddar off Ted. A queso the Mondays. Richard Greer. Keman Bear P? B? Oh, Keman Bear B. Let's go party. A game of cheese. Why I ricotta. <laughs> and some shrimp restaurant. Lady and the Scampi. Oh boy. Some of these really should have been in the episode. Thanks, Jan, for requesting this. It was a nice 
fun way to finish. Oh, boy. Okay. And we're done.